doing science. And we did that without doing science itself, and without performing research. Um, the situation in Belgium in 2000 was such that the marine uh, capacities, marine research uh, infrastructures and knowledge and data was scattered all over the country. Um, most of it was in the northern part of Belgium, which is called Flanders. And you see our short coastline in the north. Uh, it's just because of Flanders has its coastline that most of the marine research groups are located in the north of Belgium. So in Flanders, only minority is in the south French speaking part. Uh, but Felice wanted to be the first point of contact for marine sciences in Belgium. So we said we, we knew all the marine research groups, we knew what their expertise was, and we would cater for them to help them in performing their sciences. At this moment, we count more than 1,400 marine researchers distributed over various uh, universities and research institutes. And Vlis took up the role as being um, the focal point for a, a, a large virtual marine research institute. And we did this mainly on providing uh, services in data management and services in research uh, infrastructure. And good for EMBRC and Assemble Plus is that if you look at uh, also the, the, the scattered uh, various uh, uh, disciplines and the knowledge, uh, the expertise that sits in Belgium, 44% uh, of our marine scientists are actually dealing with uh, biological sciences. Uh, so we do help those scientists with access to data and information. We have set up a uh, marine library, the only one in Belgium. We set up data systems like for instance the one i've shown here in the rough on we have an environmental data set on the westerskeld estuary which is an estuary that sits in the southwest of the netherlands very close to belgium but a lot of belgian scientists do research there because it's the gateway to antwerp and the harbor of antwerp one of the major ports in the world is the, har is the motor of our economy and that's why many belgian scientists focus at the westerskeld as well uh, but we organized event as well to spread around information, uh, not only to scientists, but also to the, the public at large and uh, policy makers. Uh, so that's access to data and information. That was a major uh, focal uh, uh, activity for helping scientists and also access to research infrastructure. And that is also what we try to do for EMBRC. Uh, I will go through this uh, infrastructure uh, and how we use it for the MBRC and, and Center Plus, how it can be made accessible to not only to Belgian scientists, but also to foreign scientists. But it is interesting, I guess, to know that Belgian scientists can use this infrastructure for free. Uh, we have uh, from the very beginning used an old ship to do coastal research. We have been able to replace that by a new build, the Simon Steven, which I'll highlight uh, within the next few lights, uh, slides, I mean. Uh, the ship is totally free for Belgian scientists. Uh, also for the marine station that we've been building since 2012. And we've been setting up uh, a national pool of instrumentation and uh, instruments and sampling tools that are freely available for Belgian scientists to perform their science at sea. It includes the, uh, the, the setup of a marine robotic center, which has an ROV, which you see here, and an AUV as well. Uh, we set up a uh, data boys uh, at our coast uh, to support science. And uh, you look at one of the instruments that we purchased for the use of all the marine sciences, scientists in Belgium, which is a spy. Uh, but we have others, multi quarters, all kinds of fishing nets, plankton nets, grabs, quarters, you name it. We set up this whole national pool of instruments so that scientists don't have to buy that expensive equipment anymore. We buy it for them, we maintain it for them, and we deploy it for them. And that's a bit the same way we hope to be uh, active within uh, EMBRC uh, and in exchange to Assemble Plus. Uh, what is important is that as of 2017, uh, we did get the mandate from our financing authority to perform and initiate research ourselves. 
but we do this always again in collaboration with the research team. So every time Vlis sets up a research project, we take at least one, in most cases two or even three research teams that sit in the um, research uh, institutes in Belgium as partner and we do the science together using our capacity and our uh, uh, support activities uh, that we've been deploying since 2000. So mainly data management activities and uh, research infrastructure activities. Um, EMBRC, the Belgian note for EMBRC is actually very exemplary to that. Uh, we are a partner in the Belgian note for EMBRC. Uh, it is coordinated by our colleagues from the marine biology section at the University of Ghent. Uh, but there's quite a long list of uh, research teams that take part in this note. And it's not only the Flemish uh, research team, but also the Royal Belgian Institute, Arbins. Uh, of Brussels is an important partner. And I will show you how we work together within these activities in uh, the following slides. Um, start with uh, the Simon Steven, our uh, coastal regional research ship that was delivered in 2012, so almost 10 years old, but I still consider it as a, a new research ship. It is 36 meters long. This is multidisciplinary, so we not only cater for biologists, but for anyone who needs to do measurements or take samples, uh, whatever kind of samples at sea, both the earth sciences, even remote sensing uh, scientists we support. We can take 10 scientists and 20 students on day trips, uh, or 10 scientists on multiple, multiple day campaigns. Uh, the ship is equipped with uh, dynamic positioning has a, a silent underwater rated noise profile. So we're silent. Um, uh, and we have a whole sweep of um, sensors uh, on board of the vessel and also the necessary multi-beams, the bottom profilers, uh, ADCP, uh, you name it. You can actually take whatever kind of uh, measurement and sampling uh, you can uh, think of in coastal areas. We have an endurance of eight days for a complement of full 10 scientists. Uh, and I would love to take you on a tour through the vessel, but that would take too much time for this presentation. I think we we'll, uh, would like to in, uh, invite you to take the virtual tour. It's a bit like uh, using Google Street View and walking through a town. You can walk through our vessel. If you go to the links that I gave you above here, uh, you'll find that uh, link for the virtual tour very easily on our Facebook pages on the Simon Steven. You can on the Facebook page, you can also follow the activities of the vessel. But uh, walking through the vessel using that virtual tour might give you a very good uh, impression of what the ship is uh, capable of. Um, we use, of course, the ship to our access to Biota of the Southern Bight of the North Sea. Uh, but it's not only the ship that we have complemented during that. We also have a rigged hull inflatable boat, uh, six and a half meters long, that we use to sample and measure where the Simon Steven cannot come, mostly in the Western Scaled estuary, the surf zone areas of our beaches, and even in the harbors. This is a typical track line for the Simon Steven over one year. You see that the ship is mostly active in front of the small part of the North Sea that is called Belgium. This is the Belgian continental shelf. But often we hop into the Dutch and even in the British and the French waters. Actually, the operational area of the Simon Steven is largely comprised in the West by the harbor of Le Havre, uh, in the British Channel, in the North by Hull, and in the East by the Wadden Sea. That's the total uh, operational area of uh, the Simon Steven. It's not that we're mostly active in front of the Belgian coast, that we cannot go out on uh, areas further off of our shore. As of past year, we started with a yearly campaign even to the Dogger Bank, which is a shallower area in the central part of, uh, of the North Sea. Access to Biota is one. Access to uh, uh, other marine facilities, land-based facilities is another one. Uh, we've been creating and setting up a marine station in Austin. Uh, I'm quite sure this is the youngest marine station in the whole of Europe. Uh, it's been uh, active since 2012. 
we get a look of it, how it looks here. Uh, four old warehouses that used to be uh, shipyards, which were quite important in the maritime history of uh, Ostend. Um, we renovated it and started to use it as the uh, workshops to maintain and deploy our uh, pool of instruments to uh, mobilize them for campaigns and see, and also to set up laboratories and experimental facilities. Uh, we have uh, a biology laboratory there and an eDNA laboratory uh, that are partly funded uh, by EMVRC and by LifeWatch, especially the biology uh, lab is funded by uh, our activities in the uh, LifeWatch uh, S3 research infrastructure. And we run a marine observatory there. It's mainly focused at uh, marine zooplankton where we try to, uh, in complementarity to uh, the standard plankton observational uh, techniques, use imagery to get to a faster and more automated identification of plankton assemblages in front of our coast. We use a flow cytometer you see on the right here that is installed on board of the vessel that allows for automatic identification of phytoplankton. We often tow a video plankton recorder and we use these in complement to uh, the analysis of uh, traditional zooplankton samples on a zoo scan for zooplankton and on a flow cam to identify uh, your plankton communities using uh, image analysis and artificial intelligence to get to a quick and fast analysis of your uh, zooplankton samples. Uh, also, uh, we look into uh, the DNA of those uh, plankton communities. And since 2012, we've been running uh, a monthly monitoring campaign on these zooplankton assemblages in front of our coast and are setting up a uh, biobank of zooplankton and also of macrobanthos. We call it the biobank of the southern biotop, the North Sea. Uh, and that's a uh, an, an activity that we deploy together with LifeWatch and EMBRC. Uh, these samples and the data are available to researchers who would have an interest in the zooplankton communities that we follow up on a monthly basis in uh, front of our coasts. The experimental facilities that we are still uh, building there and augmenting include a large climate chamber with three large tanks, each of four tubes each, holding their own uh, filtration units, and you have two buffer tanks in the back of the, the climate chamber of 20 cubes. Uh, currently, we're still handicapped. We have to bring in the seawater uh, in cube retainers from our vessel and bring it to, uh, to shore uh, uh, with the cube retainers. Um, and next to these larger tanks, we also have a smaller climate room where people can uh, set up experiments using smaller units where uh, uh, can perform experiments using the seawater under uh, controlled conditions. Um, the large tanks have been used, for instance, on uh, recently on uh, research on the occurrence of uh, skin lesions in flatfish. And with our colleagues from the Royal Belgian Institute for Natural Sciences, we looked into uh, a study, or we used the tanks in a study to. Uh, the effects of climate change on the, the food chain in the coastal part of the North Sea. You can see a top view of these tanks here where uh, um, animals and organisms collected uh, with the Simon steam have been brought into the tanks and playing around with temperature and the pH levels of the, of the seawater in the tank. Uh, our colleagues from the Roger Belgian Institute uh, studied the behavior and the fate of nitrogen in the emulated uh, um, food chain uh, in, in, in those tanks. What is important is that together with our colleagues from Arbins have uh, developed uh, these cages, uh, simple structures, uh, about one by one meter cubes on which uh, plates are mounted. And next week we will redeploy these on moorings and they are left for the whole growing season until the beginning of winter when we recover them. But as they are 
placed in the sea. These plates, of course, are colonized by epifauna. And we collect those plates to use in experiments. Um, and you can see some of them, if you look well at the picture here, you see these plates that have been collected by divers. Uh, so, so one here uh, to be used in, uh, in experiments in our facilities. Um, and these three moorings, we have three of these cages, one cage positioned close to the bottom, one mid water and one at the surface. We call it the artificial heart substrate garden that we intend to keep on running together with our colleagues from Arbins as a way of collecting epifauna in, uh, from coastal areas uh, and to be used in studies on uh, biofouling or to be used in experiments. Uh, uh, we not only have these uh, facilities indoor where we can control the environmental conditions, but it has also uh, boosted the use of our facilities by other researchers. What you're looking at here is a mesocosmos uh, installation uh, outside where experiments can be done on a longer period of time using the natural fluctuations in temperature and in light. And the whole setup is covered to be protected by the rain and by the wind here on this side. But uh, these containers are actually currently filled with uh, natural sediments and we stock them with lugworms. And in these experiments, the, uh, the scientists of the University of Antwerp are looking into the potential of using bioturbation as a way to sequester CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, what they're trying to do here is to uh, look into the effects the weathering of olivine can have on your uh, chemical characteristics of the seawater. So olivine is a natural kind of sand that weathers very easily. And as it weathers, it changes the alkalinity of the seawater, uh, changing it such that it will start capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. And the bioturbation of these lugworms is enough to weather the olivine. And this is what these scientists are looking into, so using olivine in coastal zones as a way for sequestration of CO2. Uh, once this uh, facility will come will become free after this uh, project will come to an end, we will add it to our facilities that we put at the disposal for EMBRC. Um, all these facilities ask for a lot of seawater. I told you before, we have to run up and down with the vessel to bring it in, uh, in cube containers to our facilities. And we are currently constructing a seawater supply line on the plan, uh, the map here, this is where uh, Marine Station of Ostend is uh, situated. We constructed a pump house with a line and uh, it, it ends in uh, drainage pipes that sit under the sand. So we will be using the sand of the beach as a filter to pump up seawater directly. And once we are there, we'll have a higher capacity in providing seawater to facilities. And we'll be able to even expand the facilities uh, experimental seawater facilities that I've uh, shown you so far. We have other uh, plans in future. Uh, we are also running a scientific diving team for a number of years. Uh, both uh, employees from Vlis who have the necessary European sci scientific diving uh, certificate and a number of volunteers that help us a lot in uh, performing something like 50 to 60 dives on a yearly basis for various research tasks. But we're hoping to put this scientific diving team uh, at the disposal of other researchers in the near future as well to uh, complement our activities in collecting uh, fauna at, uh, at our coast. Um, that was a bit on uh, our research infrastructure and how we put that at the disposal for uh, marine biologists. But we do also uh, provide quite a number of uh, data management uh, and data support services. Uh, we're quite, uh, this is known as a uh, national oceanographic data center within the IODE concept. And we're also certified under the class of uh, world data systems. Um, we're quite a, quite a large number of uh, databases and, and data tools. I'm just going to show you very quickly now because this is not my expertise, unfortunately, what these data services can mean for uh, EMBRC. 
And in this respect, it's probably important to tell that VLIS is coordinating the biology portal of eMOTNET. So it, this underlines actually the, uh, the expertise and the capacity VLIS has in-house to do this. Um, but probably many of you are aware of what WORMS exactly is. Uh, WORMS is a database on um, uh, the, the, the global marine uh, species. So it's a taxonomic database, that's what I wanted to say, which is developed and hosted by VLIS. And you'll actually can rely there on the expertise of uh, more than 250 taxonomic experts uh, that give input to this database um, and can help you in your searching for uh, taxonomic information on, uh, on species. And this is complemented by the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, uh, which was a database on the distribution of marine species. That was actually, it's actually a legacy from the census of marine life, a large scale project that uh, was taking place in the 70s. And this has led to the creation of this OBIS data system, which is at this moment also still served and uh, the servers are hosted uh, by this. And another important database that we run uh, is the marine regions where you can find uh, a large number of uh, information on georeferent places that might uh, be very complementary to the information that you can find in the, the other two databases that I uh, show you. Uh, sorry, I cannot be too specific on these. I'm not a database manager, but I'm quite sure that if you contact this, my colleagues from the data center will help you in your search for uh, necessary uh, data services. Okay, thank you. This is what I can show you. I can this can con contribute to Assemble Plus and EMBRC and um, looking forward to any collaboration that I can have with uh, other teams and uh, would like to rely on our services and our support to your research. Thank you. Thank you, Dre. Very nice and impressive uh, facilities. So anyone has uh, any questions to ask to Dre about uh, Vliz and the, and the, and the what they have to offer. It seems as if uh, no questions at the moment. So the, just a quick question. Do you have possibilities of controlling temperature and things like that in, the, in your office, in your... Um, yes, in our... Uh, I uh, showed the tanks and the, uh, the, the smaller uh, climate room that, uh, have the smaller aquaria. We can control temperature, light conditions, and pH. Okay, good. No questions? Okay, we have a, still a few minutes to the next talk. Thank you, Dre, for your, your presentation. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Nice. This will be uh, in YouTube as well so that people can have access to this, although I think I missed the first beginning. <laughs>
So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. Of course, Assemble Plus has now been extended an extra year until uh, almost at the end of next year. And uh, we, we will be considering whether we'll have another call or not. But this, of course, it's all delayed with the, with, with, with the, the COVID uh, problems. So uh, now we're going to have the next presentation. It's the Scottish Oceans Institute, which is part of uh, MBRC UK. And uh, the David Patterson will be presenting uh, the facilities of the Scotia, Scottish Ocean Institute. Thank you, David. The microphone is off. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll put my uh, thumbnail in the corner as well. Is the screen suitable? Yeah, it's fine. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, figuratively, welcome to Scotland. I'll get the kind of stereotypes out of the way. Uh, there's snow in the hills now. So that was a, a view earlier in the year. The piper is not so common unless you're on a tourist bus, but the whiskey is, and it's been uh, essential over the last wee period. And you may know, of course, that um, yesterday was uh, Burns Day or, and also Burns Night, where we celebrate the kind of patron saint of Scottish poetry. So a nice time to be speaking to you all. Today I'm talking about the Scottish Oceans Institute and also just giving you some familiarisation with where we are and what we do. So the Scottish Oceans Institute is based in St Andrews in Scotland and um, I've just highlighted it there. A fairly unusual image, as you might know if you know anything about Scotland, no clouds in sight and a very clear image of the British Isles. The SOI is based in St Andrews, which is situated about 50 miles from Edinburgh, um, the most rapid way to get in under normal circumstances is to fly to Edinburgh and then drive from Edinburgh or take a train or bus. The University of St Andrews itself, um, the previous speaker was talking about one of the, the newest um, marine institutes. The University of St Andrews is one of the, the oldest universities in the English-speaking world, founded in about 1413. And the town of St Andrews still has some elements of the old history embedded in it. The Gatti Marine Laboratory, the stone building was uh, founded in 1896, but the marine studies go back before that, about 1884. And the first building was a, a rather um, modest stone structure, which was added to by a, a welcome research facility after in the, the 1900s. I guess the, the Gatti has always been developing and changing. And again, in about 1998, a new building was added to the side of the stone building to house the Sea Mammals Research Unit and other organizational structures there. And even more recently, and sadly in some people's view, this old stone building now no longer exists and has been replaced by a modern laboratory, which is now the home of the Scottish Oceans Institute. Every time you deal with architects who build marine stations, they seem to want to put waves into it. And ours was no different. So we have this uh, iron wave structure along the front of the building, which is also supposed to increase energy efficiency. 
Interestingly, for those of a historic bent, the only remnant of the old stone building is in the, the stone wall that they put in front of the new building. So the mission of the Scottish Oceans Institute is to conduct world-class basic and applied research. We do a lot of support to government and policy development, and of course, to educate a, a new generation of marine science scientists and provide the, the tools and innovation necessary to do that. So we now have a, a rather nice new facility, um, and I'll explain some of the resources that we have there to you. I suspect that one of them in, in a way is its surroundings in that um, this photograph couldn't be taken when the tide was in because you'd be up to your shoulders in water. So the building is right beside the sea and uh, a number of different habitats that can be accessed easily from the Institute. Inside the building, there are a variety of, of standard resources, meeting rooms, teaching space, and modern laboratory facilities. Accommodation is also available in the town and through the university's residential services. So we can cope with uh, reasonable size meetings and extended visits. I have to say at the moment, None, no such visits are taking place because of the COVID situation. But we sincerely hope that once that is resolved, we will be back to acting as a hub for international visits and research programmes. Funnily enough, this was um, last year around the same time, and this was the SOI Burns dinner and just before lockdown. And of course, we won't be having one of these this year. Uh, but hopefully we will be returning to normal when we see this number of scientists back into the laboratory once the vaccinations roll out and the situation is better controlled. The building itself was opened by our first minister, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, and that kind of shows the importance of the marine sector to the Scottish government. And Scotland is a, a relatively small administration and therefore it can be easier to get the ear of government and to discuss policy. The, the chains of command are relatively short. So it's true there is a good relationship between the scientific community and the policy at a governmental level. So in terms of the, the research themes of the Scottish Ocean Institute, there is developmental and evolutionary genomics, ecology, fisheries and resource management. And, and fisheries actually goes back to 1884 when the first funding came to the, the Gatti Marine Laboratory, which started out as a, a fisheries laboratory. Global change and planetary evolution. We're all concerned about the nature of planetary change. And so it's no surprise that there is a focus there. And then we also host um, one of the leading sea mammals research units in the world. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. In addition to the themes, some of those are focused within research centers. There's a center for biological diversity, which ranges from taxonomy, molecular analysis, big data handling, etc. The Center for Research into Ecological and Environmental Mod Modeling looking at new statistical methods and the Sea Mammals Research Unit itself. We also host the organization MASTS, which is the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology for Scotland, which brings together most of the marine active universities and organizations across Scotland into a, a single network structure. And that is very useful for dissemination of information, coming together for cooperation for um, projects and research programs, and in discussion with government over um, new planning. That's particularly relevant at the moment because as the UK leaves the European Union, there will be quite an emphasis on policy and strategy 
particularly in the marine system, which of course is critically important to the Scottish economy. So let's talk a little bit more about the science now. And uh, I'll first talk about the Sea Mammals Research Unit. So they range across sea mammals around the globe, considering population, foraging ecology, behavioral ecology, strong group in acoustics with Professor uh, Vincent Yannick, um, both in understanding the acoustics of the, the organisms, but also in developing methods and techniques and the physiology and health of different cetacean and sea mammal populations. And one of the things that uh, the laboratory is fairly famous for is the development of animal borne sensors. And you can see these tags fitted to cetaceans, which can then be used not only to judge the behavior of the animals themselves, but also uh, adding to oceanographic information, taking information about speed, temperature, ambient conditions on the dives of marine mammals. And some of this information is fed to our Met Office to help improve um, understanding of weather patterns and temperatures. So most people think of um, seals like this as charismatic beasts uh, populating the shores. And we have access to a number of sites where there are regular haulouts, including quite iconic sites like the Isle of May, um, which is featured on television, at least in the UK, quite a lot, um, studying the ecology of the, the seals that are, are there. So in terms of what the Sea Mammals Research Unit delivers, they are world leaders in the design of the animal tags I've mentioned, particularly concerned with ocean noise, natural noise, and also anthropogenic noise, animal health, monitoring of population sizes, and some of this work is done directly for government. Fisheries and aquaculture, optimizing food production, looking at industrial impacts, and food security. And part of the work, both by the Sea Mammals Research Unit and other marine scientists is looking at fish stocks and things like the effect of policy, such as bycatch, on the sustainability of stocks and their future health and development. So one of the government roles that the Sea Mammals Research Unit has is to regularly monitor population size. And this is for different types of seal. We have the gray seal and the harbor seal. And of course, population fluctuations are sometimes affected by things like um, virus and this, uh, um, harbour seal has a, a foresign distemper and that had been a, a problem in Scotland and was being carefully monitored. So we have the, the vessels that are necessary to go out and make these surveys, although interestingly many of the surveys now are done by helicopter or even drone. So there is a change in the, the way that data is collected, analysed and of course the amount of data that can be collected. Now, it's great if you can go out, but sometimes studies have to be conducted under more controlled conditions. And so at the SOI, there is one of the largest captive seal facilities, known as the pool facility, which allows animals to be brought in to um, be kept for a while under carefully controlled and licensed conditions. And this allows a number of different types of studies to be undertaken. Um, this is, photograph is actually a little out of date because the seal pool has just uh, finished a, a major refurbishment, but it gives the idea. That's a, a van for scale, and you can see the, the length of the seal pool itself. And it also has these grids which lie just at the surface of the water and can control where the animals surface allowing analysis of breath gases, etc., to look at behavior, energy efficiency, etc. And the seals can be fed on different diets and their performance under those circumstances assessed. This is all fed by filtered seawater, 
uh, that comes from the bay outside. And I'll mention that a little bit again later. Of course, we do other work. And I mentioned the sort of um, interaction between scientists and policy, which is important to us. And using TAG technology, and or at least um, developments of that, uh, one of our groups is particularly interested in inshore fisheries and developing techniques for analyzing behavior of these under, uh, about under 10 meter vessels. And these are the, the lobster fisheries, prawn fisheries, et cetera, which aren't strongly regulated in Scotland. And there is some question about how best to develop policy to control those fisheries. And this work is being conducted by a, a team led by uh, Dr. Mark James. So we do a lot of work outside. Also the new laboratory has allowed the, the development of aquaria within the, the building. And we have impressive new aquarium facilities with 11 temperature controlled rooms. Some of them capable of going down to five degrees, others to 10 degrees with uh, potential to control light, pH, etc. And so these facilities are used by scientists and also by some commercial operations. It was interesting to talk about seawater supply. Um, the seawater supply to the laboratory has just been re renewed and that was quite a task. And this is the excavation of the new pipeline, which like the previous speaker will use a, a natural sand filter to make sure water of high quality is delivered, but it's further filtered once it reaches the laboratory. It was an interesting process digging this channel um, because they could only work uh, on a tidal cycle and uh, were quite often chased up the beach by the incoming waves. But the new channel was put in and is now operational. So we have very high quality seawater supply, uh, bacterial uh, numbers are reduced and the water is filtered and supplied to the rooms. In terms of the work that is done there is quite a variety from looking at uh, photosynthetic organisms such as the, the different varieties of algae. And there are experiments ongoing at the moment looking at the effect of climate change on algal species, particularly of intertidal species, which are, uh, less is known about in terms of uh, global climate change. In addition to that, we can keep invertebrates in good conditions and allow uh, experimentation under a, different, under a number of different themes. Um, there's a strong molecular and developmental laboratory and a lot of work done by uh, David Ferrier's group looking at uh, genome organization and evolution. And they use uh, species that can be kept in the aquarium um, to develop analysis of homeobox gene clusters, how they operate and evolve. So I mentioned uh, the sea mammals research unit quite a lot, but part of the, the beauty of having um, a wide variety of scientists is that we can cascade these research themes down to different levels. So one of the things I mentioned that the Sea Mammals Unit looks at uh, industrial impacts and one of those mentioned there was plastics. So we can take the study of plastics down through the trophic levels from the sea mammals to the, the fish, to the zooplankton, to the phytoplankton. And so we measure the effects of um, plastics at a number of different trophic levels. And again, the previous speaker mentioned some work on bioturbation. And we've been using uh, fluorescent sediment profile imaging to look at the bioturbation of different organisms and how they incorporate plastics and how uh, plastics affect their functional biology. And it wouldn't be a talk by me if we didn't mention diatoms. And we also use that cascade down to the lowest levels, bacteria and the um, eukaryotic single-celled phototrophs, such as the diatoms, 
to examine the, the effects of different toxins and anthropogenic uh, factors, including plastics. For those of you not vastly familiar with diatoms, they're, as I said, unicellular, photosynthetic. They have a silica cell wall, but they're capable of locomotion through an unusual mechanism of secreting mucilage. And that locomotion is only uh, effective against a surface such as a glass plate or in natural conditions, sediments, etc. But the rate and type of locomotion can be analyzed. And we use uh, tracking, soft, uh, particle tracking software to study the speed and extent of diatom locomotion under different challenges. And this can be used as a, an assay for different types of environmental pollutant. Uh, we've used heavy metals, herbicides, and more recently looking at the effects of plastics in the environments around the diatoms themselves. In terms of the laboratory facilities, they are excellent and allow us to do everything from bacterial manipulations, biofilm growth, molecular genetics, to fish and up to, as you've seen, the sea mammals. So that full span of the, the trophic uh, linkages. And people are familiar with uh, rocky shores when we mention um, marine laboratories. That's where a lot of us got our first training in marine systems. But actually there is also a lot of work on depositional systems, including seagrasses, salt marshes, et cetera. And local to the laboratory, is a small, almost uh, perfectly set up experimental estuary, which we can use for the study of depositional systems. And this is the Eden estuary. And it may be more famous to some because it borders the Royal and Ancient, um, the St Andrews Golf Course, um, which you can just see the edge of on the, the, the left-hand side of this image of the um, Eden estuary when the tide is out. So part of the work of the, the Scottish Oceans Institute is looking at depositional systems from a, a biological and a geotechnical point of view. And you can see some zost around this image um, and a, a PhD student doing some work on sed sediment dynamics and carbon capture in these systems. We do have geotechnical facilities. <laughs> including things like uh, the vibrocoder. And as I mentioned before, we can work with uh, organisms such as diatoms and foraminifera. And we've done some work on um, foraminifera and the effects of ocean acidification on those organisms. And we can collect, incubate and experiment with those using our new facilities. Other geotechnical features looking at sediment stability. Um, this is using a, a field-based device, a cohesive strength meter, to determine the stability of the surface of the intertidal um, deep, depositional flats on the Eden estuary. Nowadays, of course, we're also using drone technology to help us um, assess and uh, reproduce these systems. And this is an interesting area of the Eden estuary where there has been some defense work done and then that uh, ends and we move into a more natural system. And so analysis of the changing in the, the depositional regime between these habitats has been carried out using uh, drone survey techniques. So finally, I just want to say something about the idea of the EMBRC. And the fact that we're only one of the participants in the UK, and that if you want more information on what the UK can deliver to the EMBRC, then please look at our EMBRC UK node website. If anything I have said interests you, then you can contact us through the SOI email here. And I have to say, I've probably done a pretty poor job of explaining all of the capability of the Scottish Oceans Institute and the School of Biology 
the School of Engineering, the School of Mass and Statistics, who are all part of the SOI and allow us to develop innovative and interdisciplinary research programs. In addition to the research, we're also clearly highly invested in teaching and run a number of master's courses using the facilities I've described. So I'll finish up in time to leave a, a little space for questions. Obviously the output of this research is targeted at high impact journals and also in gaining as much information as we can to help society be resilient to the changes that are coming in the future. So I hope wherever you are, you can see a rainbow and I hope that you can see an end to the current situation that we're in. And if we can help brighten your scientific day in any way, we'd be delighted to do so. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, excellent. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, you, you can see already from these morning presentations is really this network of marine stations institutes around Europe provide really a very diverse, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, can, it shows that people can plan work that cover wide geographic areas. They cannot, they just don't have to restrict themselves to, to one spot. And I think this is really a, a very big plus. Uh, also the fact that we are a network and we are, you know, constantly changing information also uh, provides opportunities for some standardization and, uh, and the exchange and so on. So it's, it's very, a very high potential. And uh, I can witness to uh, the facilities at, at St. Andrews at the SOI, because of course they are excellent and now the new building. Um, you know, of course the wave is, is a, an interesting one. <laughs> the, the metal frame around <clears throat> and uh, the Vries logo also has a wave. But in, fa in fact, when I look at it, I always it always reminds me of a hat. So when Vliz, Vliz comes to mind, it sounds like one of those very fancy hats. But it's waves in the cross, some, some, some plane across. Um, I still don't see any other questions. Um, yeah, it's, I think that it would be nice if there was a bit more of the Gatti left, actually. Uh, just the wall, is, is, I think it's a bit too little. Uh, I have I have a stone in my front garden. <laughs> we, were, yeah. we were very surprised because the building itself, I thought, may have been protected. Yeah. Um, but it, it was not listed in any way. I mean, the, the Gat is a very famous, and I think it's a pity that you lose the, this historical route by uh, you know, not living a bit more. But anyway, of course, there must be some reasons for that. Um, uh, the old building, I think they decided it was too expensive to turn into a modern laboratory. Um, so they would have needed considerably more funding. But yeah, I agree with you. It would have been nice to retain it. Yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? If anyone has any further questions, then they can contact me directly or they can use the SOI email. And we'd be delighted to help. We've hosted a number of Assemble uh, projects and we... Uh, yeah. We'd like to still welcome others to, to use the SOI facilities once we're able to. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. Okay, I will sign off now. Okay. <clears throat>
whether from academia, industry, or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure, and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. So many of these uh, marine stations are also uh, members of, of MBRC, and, uh, and that was the case in the UK, the same with LIS, uh, and includes other members. And now we have uh, the marine station at, uh, in the northern Spain, a Plensia marine station. It's a, a relatively young marine station, um, and it's part of MBRC Spain. And Yvonne Kansu will give us an introduction to Plensia. Come on, Yvonne. Yeah, that's my job. I hope you can see my... It's fine. It's fine. Perfect. So as you have said, my job is to present the Plensia Marine Station, which is the marine station of the University of the Basque Country. And in all respects, it's a baby marine station because it's only eight years old. If you are a star man or a star woman and you want to do rocket science, why should be you choosing the Plentia Marine Station? And on the first stand, where is the Plentia Marine Station? So the Plentia Marine Station, it's in planet Earth, but it's by the sea and is in the north of the Iberian Peninsula, right on the beach, and as I have told you, it's the marine station of the University of the Basque Country, born in 2012, to give access to the marine environment to the researchers that were doing marine biology in the university. For you to know better, we are in the north of the Iberian Peninsula, in the southern bay of Biscay. So in that beach, up there, it's the Plentia Marine Station, and you see below the biggest city in the world, which is Bilbao. Right in the middle, in between the Plentia Marine Station and Bilbao, we have the main campus of the university. That means that we also have the research services of the main campus of the university, just 15 kilometers away from the Marine Station. Close by, we have the airport, the International Airport of Bilbao, which is the only one that can claim the name Bio for, uh, for, for it. And we have the Super Harbor of Bilbao, which is the fourth biggest harbor in Spain. Close there, we have the Basque Oceanographic Institute that does mainly research on food sciences and aquaculture and fisheries. And we have one of the main fishing harbors in Spain, which is the Tuna World Capital, Bermeo. And close to Bilbao, we have the technological park that houses all the Biopask cluster of enterprises, holding 90 different biotechnological companies, mostly dedicated to clinical research. So for us, this is the Basque Blue Innovation Ecosystem in which the Plentia Marine Station and the University of the Basque Country 
are working. In regard to the international work, uh, in 2014, we made an alliance with the University of Vigo, and the idea was, okay, we are good at what we are doing, so everybody knows that the best football team in the world is Athletic Club of Bilbao, but we not very often play in the European League. So the idea was to join forces with the Marine Station of the University of Vigo. We signed an agreement in 2016, making the EMBSC a Spanish note under the signature of the Spanish Ministry of Science and Education. Our participation in EMBSC is mainly paid by the regional government. So the ministry pays the role of overlooking at what we are doing, but the money is coming from the Galician regional government and the Basque regional government. And with that, we have built a bigger team, which is the EMBSC Spanish node, working very proudly within EMBSC. So what does Plentia Marine Station have to offer? So the Plentia Marine Station is built upon three main pillars. We are the Marine Station of the University of the Basque Country. So we do need to do teaching and education, and we need to do research. In regards to education, we do house in the Plentia Marine Station three international masters. The three of them are Erasmus Mundus master students. And every year we house around 65 students in the Plentia Marine Station that come from the five continents. When it comes to our research units, we are mainly focused in ecosystem health assessment, working a lot on biomonitoring and in toxicology for reasons that will become apparent in my next, next slides. In doing so, we use resources and equipment in the Marine Biological Station, and as such, we have a service unit. And this service unit that was conceived mainly for the research of in-house researchers, it's offered inside EMBSC and Assemble Plus. When it comes to research, these are the people that try to make the magic. These are the 49 scientists, in-house scientists that spend part of the time in the marine station and in main campus. And even when we were born in 2012 and we began operations in 2013, we have already published 288 papers in internationally recognized journals. You have to think that the marine station is eight years old. So all these people you see here they consider themselves fathers and mothers of this marine station. And they do everything possible to serve the users that come to us. We all consider ourselves ambassadors of the Plentia Marine Station, of the University of the Basque Country, and of the region in which we are served. When it comes to the services we provide, we provide ecosystem access. And this is the Biscay Bay. When you come to think about the Biscay Bay, the southern part of the Biscay Bay, we are in a part of the planet in which it rains a lot, nearly as much as in Scotland. And we have an ocean that is very energetic with high turbidity, 90% of our source are rocky source and cliffs with plenty of habitats. But we also have the positional areas of beaches and beaches. That means that this is a place of high biodiversity. Due to the ocean currents, our fauna and algal coverage, it's mainly Mediterranean. It's more Mediterranean than it is Atlantic. You wouldn't come to us expecting kelp forests and we have plenty of examples of anthropogenized habitats. Habitats in which Homo sapiens has left its imprint. 
So when it comes to how to access our ecosystems, we mainly do research in the intertidal area. So we mainly access our ecosystems on foot. And many times we do process the samples in the field. So we have a mobile laboratory to do that. We can access the estuaries and close coast with a six meter zodiac that we have. We also have a group that works on subtidal bentos, mainly working on gelidium uh, algae that are suffering from the climate change. We do not offer a diving service, but we offer access to biota in the subtidal areas. So we have provided, for instance, researchers with pink sea fan that was collected by our divers, but we do not offer a diving service. We also have arranged arrangements with the commercial fishing vessels in the locality, so we can have access to marine bioresources that are normally collected by the fishermen. Close to the Precha Marine Station, we have the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve of Bay Bay and the Associated Protect Protected Biotop of San Juan de Castellubache. So within 20 kilometers, we have access to pristine habitats and many different habitats, the positional areas, rocky source. We can give you access, as I told you, to, uh, to Algal, algal mats to mud flats to beaches to rocky source very exposed to the wave to uh, intertidal ponds uh, to for instance to, for sampling different uh, animal and algal species but what is very special in our place is that we have a long polluting history Bilbao, which I have told you, which is the biggest city in the world, it developed its own industrial revolution together with the UK. Since the beginning of 1850s, British companies established themselves in the estuaries of, in the estuary of Bilbao with shipyards, steel production, and chemical industry. The population of what is considered the big Bilbao, which it goes from the center of Bilbao, 23 kilometers in the tidal range to the mouth of the estuary, from 1900 to the 21st century, experienced an expansion in population from 300,000 inhabitants to 1 million inhabitants. Of course, this had its toll, and in the 60s and 70s, there was no life at all in the inner estuary of Bilbao. The level of dissolved oxygen was nearly zero. It was a chaotic situation. But in the 80s, the situation changed, and now the Bilbao estuary is approaching an acceptable status. The oxygen came back to the estuary and the estuary is recovering. In, said, in having said that, that means that we can provide access to anthropogenized ecosystems, to pollution gradients. We have the super harbor of Bilbao and we have an, a strong input of invasive species. We can do research on recovery process. We can give you access to beaches where you have cemented sand rocks formed by iron foundry slugs. We have intertidal mud flats where you have huge concentrations of metals. On top of that, 10 years before we were born, we experienced the prestige oil spill in the north of the Iberian Peninsula. That oil spill reached all the way to the southern bay of Biscay and to France. And we were in charge of assessing the state of the environment. And we were developing biomarkers of pollution and developing ecosystem health 
indexes. At that moment, it became very apparent that we needed a basal record of biological responses in order to be able to assess which is the effect of an acute oil spill, for instance. So, banking on that, in the Plentia Marine Station, we house the Biscay Bay Environmental Bio Bank. Sorry. And I have a video that I want to show it. So you, showing you the Biscay Bay Environmental Biospecimen Bank that was born after the prestige oil spill. In the biobank, we house different specimens, mainly from pollution sentinel organisms. We have a biobank of tissue in paraffin for histological research, fish otoliths, or cells of mollusks that have been collected in the Biscay Bay during the last 20 years. We have a bank for sediments. We have a bank of histological sections produced during the last 20 years of these sentinel organisms. And most importantly, we have a cryobank. We have a cryobank in which we keep different specimens of these organisms in nitrogen in a special security system. We have a continuous supply of nitrogen to keep them. And these specimens are available for any researcher that would like to do research on these specimens. We mainly host sex, uh, tissues of bivalve mollusks and different fish species, and we also house tissues of stranded marine mammals. It has got a security system. Of course, all this material, whenever it's provided, it can be finished. So we have initiated a process to our advanced microscopy service to scan the slides that are in our biobank. So we have a high resolution scanner in which we can scan more than 300 slides at the moment. I scan them high resolution. You see there are three tissues of a fish. That's the ovary with previtelogenic oocytes. So we don't need to send you the slide. That's the liver and the hepatocytes. So that means that if you are the star man, you don't have to really come to us. We can provide remote access to some of our uh, specimens. On top of that, we also house the Basque Microalgae Culture Collection. The catalog of the Basque Microalgae Culture Collection was published online last uh, week. At the moment, you will be able to browse there around 300 different strains, although we house 600 different strains of microalgae. And in the frame of the EMBSC project, EBB, we are working towards ABS clearance of all these uh, biological resources that we provide. An important thing of our marine station is that we house uh, different aquaria facilities to do research under control conditions. The samples, when they come from the field, they can come to the dissection room, they are dissected and they can go to the biobank or to direct research. That's our dissection table where we have even dissected whales. We have an algae growing uh, growth room. We 
we have a room with control temperature and control light for invertebrates. Another one for toxicity testing with invertebrates and slow, uh, small volumes. And we have aquaria tanks of different volumes ranging from 200 liters to 1,000 liters in which we can do toxicological research with teleos uh, fish species. We also have two mesocosms of 20,000 liters for OXO for toxicological, arranged specifically for toxicological research. So this is our one of our users. So you have pets who are friendly. So which kind of model species uh, do we work normally with? Uh, most of our model species, we do work with them because they are sentinel organisms. We work a lot with bivalves, gastropods, copepods, and crustaceans in toxicity tests and environmental biomonitoring, also with sea urchins. We work with other invertebrates because they are models to study uh, symbiotic relationships. And we do a lot of work with teleost uh, fish species, different species. We also can work with zebra fish. We have uh, a facility to work uh, uh, with zebra fish. And we do work a lot with commercial fish species because we are a fish eating nation. And if you come and visit us, you will be able to taste them. Then, what it comes to the research platforms, the research platforms that we house in the Pencha Marine Station, we have molecular biology lab and a platform for omics. Of course, nobody is going to come to us to do a next generation sequencing, but we have the facilities for next generation sequencing in campus. We are a clinical lab when it comes to histological processing, and we have a very well assorted microscopic microscopy and image analysis platforms. We have cell culture and microbiology uh, platform, and we have a very potent group in analytical chemistry and services for analytical chemistry. Most of these plat those platforms are in-house in the Plencia Marine Station, but 15 kilometers away, we also have the general research services of the main campus of the university, which are also can be also that come to us. When it comes to the uh, to these uh, platforms, let's listen to one of our users that use the analytical chemistry platform. So 
in regard to our work in a summer plus, we have been deeply involved in the genome observatories, both in the ocean sampling day and the, the in deployment of arms devices. So we will continue with an EMBSC working on EMOPON. Linked with that, uh, the development of the genome observatories, it's an opportunity also for us to, uh, because we have a big, um, a big collection of data that it's not made available in the fair and the fair principle. So this is the opportunity for us to make this data also available. We also have supporting facilities for the people coming to us. We have uh, an auditorium, we have lecture rooms, we have seminar room, and we have office space. Possibly we have the best views in the Southern Bay of Biscay to the Plentia Bay. So with that, we would like to welcome you whenever you would like. We are expecting you to come and it will be our honor, honor to receive you at PA. Anything that you may need, just contact us. Xavier Lecube is our access officer and he will be in charge of informing you. And you know, this is the place where sometimes there is purple rain. So come to our place where there is purple rain and big waves. And with that, I'm open to your questions. Thank you, Yvonne. That was very, very interesting as it, it showed that, you know, this, the, the diversity of, of opportunities and also the wide ranging uh, facilities that you've got there. Uh, anyone would like to ask questions? Of course, it's uh, now, you know, at the moment we are all a bit restricted, but we're ready to receive people as soon as, as it allows. Uh, and that, that should be maybe the second part of this year. I hope that uh, things will start moving. Well, see if there is no other questions. Well, so thank you everyone that presented this morning, uh, Yvonne, Dave, Andre, and uh, we'll be back in about half an hour for the next uh, group of talks about uh, which will be done by visitors to many of these marine stations. So thank you and see you soon. NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more.